Okay, I'll get started. Uh, my name is Stefan Heinotzi, and uh, I prepared this presentation together with Michael Zirkin. Michael uh, couldn't attend in person today, so uh, I'll just be presenting it. Um, so we're going to talk about trust confidentially and hardening uh, of the Linux Vareo drivers. Um, and so what that means is I'm going to talk about the status of the Linux Vareo drivers trust model today and also how we got here. Uh, so that means kind of the, the hypervisor architecture and where Vertio comes from, uh, as well as how IOMMUs fit in and hardware Vertio devices uh, and Linux VDUs, how they change the, the trust model that the Vertio drivers had. And then we're going to look at where we're going. Um, and, and that means new work um, that's related to confidential computing, uh, in particular, um, untrusted devices as well as trusted TDIS uh, devices and, and how they will fit in with the Vertio drivers. Okay, so first uh, a quick introduction to Vertio. Um, Vertio is an open standard for IO devices and it's supported across a range of hypervisors as well as guest operating systems that are running in VMs. So it comes from the, the, the background of, of virtualizations, running virtual machines. Uh, now it's used in, in kind of a a wider context as well, but the, the basic thing that you have and the thing that we're going to focus on today is the fact that you have a driver that is talking to the device and we're going to look at the trust relationship between the driver and the device. So if you want to go and check out the details of what Verdeo is, what it can do and so on, uh, there's a link to the specification. So. What Verdeo has is it offers a set of standard devices. This is kind of similar to USB class compliant devices in the sense that there's a standard that tells you here's how a Verdeo network interface works or a Verdeo block device or a Verdeo GPU and so on. And if a guest driver exists for your OS, then you'll be able to, to use that driver with any device implementation that is compliant to the Verdeo specification. So it does, it, you could be running your guest OS on any hypervisor that implements Vertio. Okay, so what are the applications of Vertio? Um, this is kind of interesting just to, if you don't have a background in Vertio, to kind of understand where it's used, but it's also very important today for what we're going to go through because these applications actually have different trust models. Um, we're going to start with the traditional virtualization use case, uh, which is that you have a hypervisor, and this hypervisor offers these Vertio devices to the virtual machines. That's how the virtual machines do IO. These Vertio devices are doing IO on behalf of the guests. Then we're going to look at Linux VDUs, which is a way of kind of reusing Vertio devices, even for bare metal and container applications. So you don't have a virtual machine there anymore necessarily. Um, and um, that's what VDUs does. Then we'll look at the hardware Verdeo devices, which are becoming more popular, where you can have a, an actual physical Verdeo net device or so on, uh, like a, a PCI device. Uh, and then we'll look at confidential computing, both with software devices and with hardware devices. There's lots of interest from CPU vendors and, and, and cloud vendors um, around this right now. Um, and this is where the most where, where the open questions that I'm going to uh, present really are and then the work that we still need to do. Okay, so let's start and let's look at the trust model. So in traditional virtualization where you have a hypervisor and you have a, a Vertio device, uh, the driver is going to send IO buffers to the device and the device will then copy in and out. So say it's a network device, then the device is going to DMA, it's going to co copy in the packets that are being transferred to and from this network device. In order to do that, the devices need to have access to guest memory. So that's kind of the, the, the starting place. And in traditional virtualization, the device, especially with, with KVM's model, I mean, it depends on your hypervisor, but here I'm talking about Linux, uh, Verdeo, and, and KVM. Uh, the devices have access to all of guest memory. So let's look at what that means. What if the device is malicious? What if uh, a, a malicious device can read from guest RAM? Well, it can extract any sensitive information you have in there, any passwords, any cryptographic keys, any application-specific sensitive data. Uh, and this is basically why, in most cases today, if you are running a virtual machine 
with some hosting provider, they can actually see everything that's going on inside your VM. But it gets worse, right? Because what if the device is malicious or the hypervisor is malicious and it writes to your guest memory? What can it do? Um, easy thing is just overwriting memory, right? Can pretty easily crash your driver or your OS or your application. But the more worrying stuff is changing the state of the VM. So say you have an application that's keeping track of account balances, then it can suddenly you have a million dollars, right? Because you, you just changed that variable. Um, and even worse is code execution, not just changing some values, but really being able to gain a foothold inside the guest. So breaking the isolation between the guest and the hypervisor. That's pretty easy to do too, right? Because what could it do? It could overwrite some instructions in, in, in guest RAM, and then the, the vCPU executes some. One way or another, you'll be able to do that. So. What that means is that the guest is basically fully under control of the hypervisor in the traditional virtualization use case. There's not much you can do about it because the memory is exposed. And as a result of that, although the Linux Verdeo drivers historically, of course, they've tried to follow good software engineering practices and have defensive coding and so on. But at the end of the day, there was no way they could protect themselves from the hypervisor because the hypervisor could always scribble over memory or spy on it if it wanted to. So it's kind of futile to, to try and add any security in there. And that's what the state was for a while in Vertio. So now let's look at some of these other use cases that I mentioned, they came later, and that's where we had to extend the trust model uh, and harden things. Okay, so the first one I'll cover is Linux VDUs, because this is an interesting use case that flipped things uh, on its head. So with Linux VDUs, the, the use case you have for, for using VDUs might be that you already have VMs and you already have a Vertio based IO stack, could be storage and or networking. And now you want to add bare metal workloads or container workloads. What do you do? Do you duplicate your IO stack um, and have to manage that as well? Or is there a way to unify them? Well, VDUs is a, a way of of unifying them. You can use Vertio devices even on bare metal um, and with containers, for example. Uh, if you want to check out more about VDUs and how to use it and what it is, uh, uh, check out that link. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm going to focus on the trust model. So what does this mean? So what VDUs allows you to do is you take the existing Vertio driver, say a Vertio net device, but instead of that driver talking to a hypervisor below um, the, the kernel, it actually talks to a user space Vertio device that, that's implemented in user space running on the same kernel. So that way you're using that same driver. And we flipped the model on its head. Previously in traditional virtualization, uh, as I explained, there's really nothing that the guest driver can do to isolate itself and protect itself from the hypervisor, which has full access to the guest driver. But now what we have is we have that driver um, talking to user space. And the kernel shouldn't trust user space. So now we have a problem because the drivers are likely to be vulnerable. So let's talk a little bit about that kernel and user space trust model in Linux, because it's not 100% intuitive. You might think, hey, I have a root process. It can do anything, right? So why, why do I need to have any trust or any security? If I have root in user space, I can reconfigure the system or I can access any user data. But actually in Linux, there's a distinction there. Even though a root process and if you, whatever Linux capabilities that process has can do all these things, it must still not be able to corrupt kernel memory. And it must not be able to gain kernel code <coughs> execution. And the reason for that is things like signed kernel modules and trusted boot and kernel lockdown, because they, they, they add a nuance to this. And they basically say, we're going to keep the kernel safe. And it won't be modified, you know, unless you are able to load a signed kernel module, for example. So only only safe things like that. Uh, and so VDUs has to honor this model. And as I mentioned, the I/O buffers that we have, that our Vertio drivers trying to transfer packets to a Vertio net device, for example. Well, we don't want user space VDUs to have access to kernel memory just in order to transfer packets, right? Because that would be unsafe. It would be able to do anything it wanted if it had access to all of kernel memory. 
So for, for Linux VDUs, when this was introduced and the patches were on the mailing list, people pointed this out and said, well, we've got to harden stuff. This is not okay. We need to have some layer of isolation. And the two things we need to look at there, these, these two arrows on this diagram here, are one, when the driver parses a response from the device, it really now needs to go through everything and validate all inputs. It can no longer trust the device because the device lives in user space and it may be malicious, so we're not gonna trust it. And two, we need the memory isolation that I just mentioned. So let's talk first about the input validation, how that happened. So when people realized this, there was a community effort, uh, it was like a multi-person effort. People went through the Linux Vertio driver code and they audited it. They had a look at places where the drivers were fetching values from the device um, where there could be some danger and we needed to do more careful input validation. And so a bunch of these patches went in. I put, I put on one, uh, sorry, the font is a bit small, but it's one of the smallest ones that I was able to fit uh, on a slide. And basically what this is doing is when the Vertio block driver starts up and it asks the device how many vert queues there are, um, previously, if the device said, I have zero vert queues, the driver would have been like, okay, zero queues, which makes no sense, by the way, because then you can't actually use the device. And it would have just run, and it would have had some null, like uh, empty memory allocations and trouble uh, would, have, would have kind of occurred down the line. So this was not safe. Uh, and this patch simply just added an if statement to, to block that. Uh, and a number of these patches were, were written by, by people who, who were auditing the code. And so now the Vertio core code, by that I mean the, the V-Ring code, the stuff in drivers Vertio, as well as a bunch of the devices have been uh, fully audited and, and they now validate all input. Um, another way of looking at this would have been with fuzzing, but I don't think we explicitly did this. It would have been to fuzz the, the, the Vertio drivers by feeding them garbage and then seeing, okay, so you did it. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so that would be another way of finding these places, but this is something that needs to be done in order to harden them for the VDU's model. Okay, so back to the kernel, how to expose kernel memory and so on. So the way that this is done in hardware, like in PCI, for example, is that you have, uh, if you have an IOMMU, the IOMMU is a component that can interpose the memory accesses between the device and the actual memory. Instead of allowing them through, it can check permissions that have been programmed into the IOMMU by the driver or the, the, the operating system to make sure that the device can actually only access certain memory regions, the memory regions that have the IO buffers you actually want to transfer to the device. If the device tries to snoop some other memory uh, the IOMMU will block it because it's been programmed not to allow that. And so VDUs kind of has a solution that's very similar to that. It has this IOTLB uh, and it has an IOCTL where user space, when it wants to process buffers from the vert queue, it has to ask the kernel and it says, please give me a, a file descriptor. And this magic file descriptor will only give you access to the IO buffer pages and nothing else. And by the way, I think there's also a bounce buffer inside VDUs. So if that kernel buffer is not a full page, it copies it to a separate page and only has the payload there. That way, if the kernel had any other data structures or things on the same in the same page frame, they won't be leaked to user space. Or, or, so um, yeah, the memory is isolated. And this is how VDUs solved that problem. Okay, and that's that's kind of the end of VDU. So with that, it was possible to run these user space VDUs devices and use the Vertio drivers on a bare metal kernel. And they were talking to user space and we had fixed that, you know, that trust relationship to make sure that we were safe, even if user space is not trustworthy. Okay, so the, the next use case I wanted to mention is hardware Vertio devices. Because hardware Vertio devices are interesting because they are not actually part of the hypervisor. So they don't actually have all the same access rights that I mentioned in the beginning. I said in the traditional virtualization use case, the hypervisor can touch anything. Well, with hardware Vertio devices, if you have a separate PCI device, you do have that IOMMU in the middle. You can uh, confine that device so it cannot access all memory. So that's great. And we also have the hardening that we did for VDUs. Uh, 
to make the drivers not trust the device anymore. And so with those two things together, when you use a hardware Bird I.O. device, there is actually more isolation than when you just use a software device that's built in to the hypervisor. OK, I think there's not really that much more to say about hardware Bird I.O. devices because they're, they're basically covered by, um, by what was already done for VDUs. OK, so next we'll move on to confidential computing. So with confidential computing, the idea is that you can deploy uh, a workload um, with uh, a hosting provider that you don't necessarily trust. Or maybe you, you do trust your, your infrastructure because you're self-hosting it or something like that, but you would like to have an additional layer of security. So if a host is compromised, the VMs aren't automatically exposed as well. So those, those are some of the goals. Um, that uh, people try to, to achieve here. Uh, and it's still a work in progress. I mean, there's, the, there's been the, the microconference track uh, and a lot of talks here today <laughs> at LPC are about uh, confidential computing. So still a lot of things haven't settled yet. Um, if you want to see, there is an article about the different platform specific implementations of confidential computing and how power and uh, Intel and uh, ARM, you know, and so on, uh, how, how they do it, and, and a short comparison if you're interested in that stuff. But I'm going to talk about how the Bird I.O. drivers uh, can be dealt with in, in a confidential computing scenario. So first, I want to just mention that the way confidential computing works is to reduce the trusted computing base, so reducing the number of software and hardware components that you need to trust in order to run your workload. And the, the unique big feature, the, the like surprising thing is you don't need to trust your kernel or your hypervisor anymore. They're no longer trusted. So you still have to trust the CPU, obviously, because it's executing the CPU instructions. So you can't really hide anything for, from it. And the important thing, I think, to mention is that uh, the physical and side channel attacks are out of scope in confidential computing. So it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't automatically make everything safe, and someone determined could probably still find other issues. And denial of service is another thing that's kind of out of scope. It's still always possible because even though the hypervisor may long, no longer have full access to everything that's happening inside the guest, the hypervisor is responsible for managing resources, so they can easily withhold resources and just not give you the resources. So denial of service is possible. So how does this work? Well, the two important mechanisms are that the hypervisor does not have access to the CPU uh, registers and, and CPU state when the, 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 the guest is running. So there's some protection there. Otherwise, the hypervisor could just single step the guest and see what's going on, but it can't. The other thing is that guest RAM needs to be protected, right? Because we've that was kind of our starting point here where we said, well, if guest RAM is uh, uh, accessible to the hypervisor or the device, then it's very hard to isolate it and have trust. And confidential computing takes care of that. It protects guest RAM. So how does it do this? Um, memory, memory encryption is the, the seems to be like the, the, the common uh, approach that, uh, that the different implementations across CPU architectures are taking now. And that basically means that while the CPU is in guest mode, the loads and stores are transparently uh, encrypted and decrypted. And when the CPU is not in guest mode, when it's in root mode, so it's in the hypervisor or in the kernel, then that transparent encryption is off. And so if the hypervisor tries to snoop and read guest RAM, it will just read the encrypted data, the, the ciphertext, and it will just be junk. So that's, that's the, the mechanism for, for, for guest RAM. An important thing here is integrity protection, because just encrypting it, just having confidentiality is not enough, um, especially from the point of view of the Vertio drivers. Our drivers expect that if they load a value from RAM, they will not get junk back, right? <laughs> so if someone has tampered with it, we need to detect it. We, we don't want to read junk back if the hypervisor has uh, just written something to an encrypted memory page. I think that's important because it's it's a very difficult programming model 
if in your program, anytime you read something, you might read junk back. So um, again, I think this is this is now the current state of the art. I think that the different CPU vendors are all offering it, but it was not from the beginning. So I'm just mentioning and pointing out explicitly that integrity protection is probably something that any sane uh, driver that doesn't trust its device really needs. Okay. So oftentimes when, so I think probably a lot of people here know about confidential computing, so I'm not gonna go through this, but in case there is anyone who says, you know, prove it, how can this even work? I do have a slide here. We can go back to later. If, if you ask questions later, I can, I can show you because sometimes people think, oh, you, how do you not trust the hyperwrite? How do you not trust the kernel? But I'm gonna skip that part because we've had plenty of confidential computing content here. So untrusted devices. This is, this is our first step. So let's say we have one of these confidential VMs now and we give it a VertIO device. What can we do? So let's start with networking. If you have a network interface, obviously you don't really want to send unencrypted traffic. This is an untrusted device that's in the hypervisor. You're all good, your memory is encrypted. The hypervisor can't, um, can't tamper with your state. But if you're using unencrypted network connections, you're gonna be in trouble because the hypervisor can easily uh, tamper with the traffic that you're sending over your network interface. So that's an obvious thing, but luckily for, for a very, very long time, the kind of security model in the networking world has been, well, there can always be a, an evil router. And so you need to use encryption, end-to-end -end encryption. And so there's not a lot you actually need to do to secure networking in confidential computing. You can have an untrusted Vardionet device that the hypervisor provides you, and you don't need to trust it, right? You just use TLS. You just make sure your, your traffic is end-to-end -end encrypted. If it's tampered with, TLS will detect that. Uh, you know, it can't be snooped. Uh, of course, the traffic analysis and, and, and so on patterns can be seen, but the data is protected. So that's VertIO.net. So what do we do about store? And, and by the way, if, if anyone disagrees or has questions, then jump in and let me know. If you, if you feel there are open issues with networking or something you want to mention. Okay. So next up is storage. What do we do about the disk? Luckily there, there are also pre-existing solutions. They weren't even made for confidential computing, but they can be used here to protect us and, and achieve the, the tr trust model that we need. So normally when you have a disk, maybe some data can, can be corrupted just due to the nature of the physical media and so on, but you're not really expecting to have a malicious disk. So with confidential computing, it can be malicious, right? So now we've got to protect against that. But um, DMcrypt exists in Linux, uh, and so does DM integrity. And when you combine the two, DMcrypt gives you the confidentiality, DM integrity gives you the integrity protection so that the encrypted data isn't tampered with. So if you use those two, then you have an encrypted disk. And now you don't need to trust the Verdeo block device. Now it's okay to data there. You only have one problem. Like, what do you do with the key? Where do you put the key for unlocking the disk? And so there's various schemes to do this. I won't get in, into it, um, but it can be done. And so then you, you're able to use an untrusted disk. So the, the, the only missing piece here that I haven't mentioned is that if you have an untrusted device, a, tr a device that's part of the hypervisor, and you had this encrypted memory that I mentioned, how can the device actually talk to the drivers? Because the drivers, when they put structures into uh, memory for the device to consume, that memory will be encrypted. How did the two worlds talk? So the answer to this is that the, the confidential computing implementations, the CPU architectures, they allow the VM to be set up so that some of the memory pages are not encrypted, they are shared. Um, so this way you can communicate between the two worlds. And the way this is integrated into the, the Linux driver um, ecosystem is that the DMA API in Linux that drivers use um, can go through the software IOTLB. And software IOTLB doesn't come from confidential computing either. It's, it's a pre-existing piece that was made to get around address limitations in hardware, but it can be used here. So basically uh, what software IOTLB does when it's enabled is it uses bounce buffers. And what it can do is it can place these bounce buffers into unencrypted memory. And then you give that address of that unencrypted memory bounce buffer to the device. And the device can do IO 
uh, and it works. The encryption isn't getting in the way. And then before the driver consumes it, it gets copied back into encrypted memory. The driver makes progress. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a paper this year that looked at the performance overhead of software IoT of being confidential computing. That's kind of interesting to look into. I'm not going to go into the details now, but check that out. They, they also have some optimizations that are um, you know, worth, worth looking into. Uh, the spoiler is that basically uh, they say, well, if you're already doing end-to-end -end encryption, like disk encryption, then what's the point of having the bounce buffer? Uh, you should just encrypt straight into shared memory. Um, and then the device can consume that. So uh, it gets rid of the bounce buffer, which is nice for performance. OK, so now I'm going to start to move on to the open issues, because everything I've mentioned right now, I've said everything is great, everything is working, and it's not. <laughs> so um, the first thing is interrupt hardening. So one of the things that's uh, an open issue um, in, in, in Vert.io, for sure, and, and, and probably also in other Linux device drivers, is that when the driver initializes, it will configure the interrupts that the device uh, has. And right now, in Vert.io, those interrupts are immediately enabled. So the interrupt handlers that are installed are, are enabled. And if you think about it, on a, on a well-behaved device, a non-malicious device, those interrupts will only fire in response to some driver activity, like the driver submitted some I.O. and then I get a, an interrupt when, when, when the I.O. is done. But a malicious device could raise that interrupt at any time. And so there's a race, there's, there's a window here where perhaps drivers were never tested and never considered that interrupts might come in and trigger the interrupt handler function. And that's a bad thing because maybe that handler function accesses some device driver state and Interrupts are set up at some point during driver initialization, and then a bunch of other stuff gets initialized. So maybe our state is not fully initialized yet. And so there's a risk that there are basically some, um, some there's some undefined behavior in interrupt handler functions that can be triggered if a malicious device sends interrupts that we don't expect yet. And so there's a solution to this. Linux actually does provide a way for request IRQ to register the interrupt handler, but not turn on the interrupt yet. And I think that was attempted. There were some patches upstream, but they couldn't be merged because they didn't work with Linux's affinity managed interrupts. So basically, we don't have a solution to this yet. So this is something where more work is needed. Um, but I also don't think anyone, I don't know if anyone has a concrete example of where there's an exploit or something, but it's definitely a questionable area where there probably could be some, some dangerous things. So this is, this is something that still needs to be done to protect against malicious devices. The next thing is speculation barriers. Because in the traditional model, if you trusted the hypervisor and you couldn't hide anything from it, then you didn't really care about speculative execution attacks. The hypervisor didn't need to use them because it could just read stuff from, from guest ground. But now in this world, it is important. And if there's a software device, and you're switching from the guest driver into the software device, then speculative execution attacks become a problem, like Spectre uh, style attacks. So um, the only thing that kind of helps us a little bit here in confidential computing is that the memory is encrypted, right? So, hmm, but maybe not. So it, it's definitely, I think, something that still needs to be audited and, and thought through. There are currently no uses of the no spec macros in the Vertio driver code. So I don't think anyone has really done anything to protect against this. Um, so this is, this is another area for future work where probably some hardening still needs to be done because it's it, until now, the drivers have never had to worry about this. Okay. So what I've talked about so far are the untrusted devices, where you can actually just use the hypervisor's Vertio net, Vertio block, and it will work with confidential computing. But there are some device types that you probably really need to trust in order to use at all. And if you think about it, if you have something like the serial console, the Vertio serial console, well, you can never really use that. Because say the user logs in, 
Well, the device can sniff the, their password when they log in. Or the device could inject some fake input events in order to you know, run a shell command inside your VM. So you're never really going to be able to trust them unless you have some kind of end-to-end -end trust relationship where you really do trust the source of where these input events are coming from. And it's the same with output. Right? If, you want to, if you don't want uh, the hypervisor to be able to see what output your Vertio GPU is producing, what do you do? So we're kind of, kind of have a problem here with these types of devices. Like, how, how do you trust them? One way is to just say, we don't need trusted devices at all, these, these types of devices. Instead, we'll just use SSH, like just use networking and end-to-end -end encryption for absolutely everything. But there is a way to do trusted devices. So that's, that's the next phase. And uh, PCI has tdisp, which is a way for you to basically extend the TCB. We said we're going to try to reduce the TCB, but if you really need to trust a specific device, tdisp will allow you to authenticate, uh, or to, to check it's really the device you're talking to using attestation, um, and then protect the, uh, the communication that's going on between the driver and the device. And the nice thing is that if you a test the device and you're using tdisk, then you don't need to use software LTP. Then the memory encryption stuff is handled and you can get the performance boost back. So in this mode, if we had trusted devices, then basically what we need to make sure is that we only load drivers um, and talk to devices that uh, really are trusted. And what I mean by that is in Linux, when you have a driver, say Vertionet, which device implementation are you actually talking to when you load that driver? The driver will work with, I said there's a Vertigo standard and it will work with any hypervisor's implementation, but you probably only trust one implementation and maybe even a specific hardware revision or a firmware revision of that device, right? So if you have a Vertigo net driver in your kernel, you need some way to specify and say, oh, actually, I only I don't trust all Vertionet devices in the world. I only trust certain devices where I actually trust the vendor. And I know that that, that model is the one I want. And so we don't have this today. There's no way of doing this um, in, in the kernel today. Like either you have Vertionet and it will just happily talk to any Vertionet device that you want, or you don't. So we need some way to specify that. And if you don't have a trusted device, then you need to decide whether you don't want to load the driver at all and talk to that device because it's untrusted, or whether you're willing to do it, but you want to use software LTOP. Um, so with Vertio Net, it would make sense to use software LTOP. With something like Vertio Serial, you would not want to because you cannot trust the device. Okay, so what I'm getting at here is that we need some policy, right? We need some user policy where users can say, okay, on my systems, I have these device implementations. This might be a specific Vertio block and a specific Vertio net or whatever. And I want the driver to load with them. And I don't want the driver to load with any other devices. And that way, uh, your confidential VM can select which devices are trusted. But it, it goes deeper than this. Um, there's, there are a bunch of different options that users of confidential VMs have. Like, for example, when you use Vertio PCI, you drag in PCI and you drag in, maybe you'll also drag in ACPI. Um, so you have these dependencies and some users may say, no, 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 no. I need something very minimal. I want Vertio MMIO. Um, so you can, you can see that there's different choices here between like how, how minimal do you want to make your VM? And on top of that, there's also some functionality that you might want to disable. Like, do I want to allow hot plug or not? And in Vertio, if you've looked at Vertio, there are a bunch of optional features. And some of them add complexity and could be a security issue. Do I want to enable specific features that Vertio has? So these are all things that I think there is no one answer. Different users will have different policies. Um, okay, so how do we set this policy? Well, no single kernel parameter will express it. It needs to be, um, you know, more more expressive than just that. And I don't really have uh, a solution. I don't know if anyone here has uh, solutions to it. Um, I mean, one one thing might be some 
some policy tools that uh, allow you when you build your confidential VM to say, okay, these things are okay, these things are okay, and everything else, don't do it. Um, and the question is like how to actually do that, how to add that um, into the kernel. Um, and I think the only thing that I still want to add to that is this is not specific to Vert.io. This talk is about Linux Vert.io, but actually all drivers need it, especially with TDIS where we're gonna see arbitrary PCI devices that can do attestation and be trusted. So this is more general than Vert.io. It's probably as general as all devices in Linux. So probably should be part of the base or core driver API. Um, yeah. So I think, that, I think that's where things will be going and Vert.io will, will have to be part of that and will have to fit in there. Okay. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, the Verdeo drivers have been hardened, in particular for the VDUs and the hardware Verdeo use case. Um, and confidential computing is still work in progress. So we have these untrusted devices that work, but they're just the first step. And the second step are the trusted devices, so, so TDISP. But for that, we definitely need uh, user policy and configuration to make that um, work. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Hi. So one thing I think got a little bit confused in here is if you only want to trust the device, you don't need TDISP. You need the the early bit of the stack, SPDM, CMA, uh, all that side of things. If you just want to know, I'm talking to the device I think I'm talking to. TDISP only tends to come in if you want to be writing sufficiently trusted that you write directly into the encrypted memory, where you've got to set the magic T bit. Okay. So there are various layers here, all more policy. Uh, you may want any of them. Who knows? Okay, so I think that that's an interesting point. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah, so TDIS, if you want to turn off software, I'll TV. <laughs> that, that thing about the interrupts, where you were getting them before it was, um, we've actually had that in the real world on physical hardware before, where the BIOS would have done something and then turn it on and then it would interrupt your stack and things would explode. So there has been a few cases of that in actual physical hardware. The other one that used to get is I think IOM used stop is um, when you turned on PCI bus mastering, if the BIOS had done some DMA transaction was left in the in the device, yeah. and you turn on bus mastering and it up blows up your whole stack as well. Um, so yeah, I don't think that's a problem when you have an IOM you, but um, one thing I wanted to just, you talked about the GPU access. We've just added a new feature to the Vertio GPU to allow passing through like the, the host native contexts. I'm not sure if that's something you, you, you how, how that would work in I guess it probably I think it probably have to go towards SRIOV or something to actually do you know access to the GPU acceleration as opposed to just GPU outputs. But I, I, I think that's all up in the air and how it's going to work but I'd yeah be interested if there's anyone that's talking about it. I, I think the only thing that like I would like to respond uh, to that is that I think that's that like that native context uh, stuff which is like a pass-through kind of solution is an example of one of these features where maybe people need to have like the user policy maybe when you're doing something where you don't trust the device you turn that off but maybe you still want a basic frame buffer and you know basic vertio gpu there just not the stuff that's dangerous and too complex so that's why we need the policy yep. So you're talking with like you made this, this statement with like you know Virtio has been hardened. So that and we said that it's for core and, and, and Virtio drivers. So does it apply for all the modes that Virtio operates, like you know split versus packed, and so on? So because that's I think I mean there are a lot of details where like. Oh. So you tell me, because <laughs> oh, so I, I think this is yeah yeah uh, that's that's why this is I your mean, document. We, <laughs> we, we, we looked into it. Okay, we are yeah. referring to our our docs. Yeah. So, so this is yeah. Yeah, so I, I thought this was very interesting that the document that was released for TDX says we have looked at Vertio, but Vertio PCI, use it with the split vert queue and disable indirect descriptors, because this is not how you would run Vertio on a non-confidential VM. You would enable packed V-ring, you would enable indirect descriptors. So it's clear that there are some features here in Vertio that for some reason, like 
someone who audited the code maybe wasn't comfortable with or didn't want, so you decided to, to disable. So, so, so the logic, like, you know, we, we had to look at everything. So we were trying to just minimize to say, okay, so what is the minimal set we can run with? And of course, like, you know, things like console is just for development and stuff, but like uh, this split word queue was selected because it was Jason Wang's patches, which, which like, you know, moved to addresses and things. It wasn't done for the uh, packed one. So that's why it was like, you know, big, big, not like, you know, it is a packed, pack doesn't look secure. So, but I mean, we, oh, we can... so fundamentally in its design, the packed vert queue layout is not. You so, so it doesn't it. seem like, you know, this address, um, you know, the things such as split queue, the address of, of, of the scriptures and things never moved to a private memory. So now that's protected. So we know what, like, you know, the, the, the device can't really, you know, mess up with that. But with packed, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Okay. Or I don't know, maybe we misunderstood something, but like, but that, that's was. Okay. And and same like you know if you use split word queue, but you enable in direct descriptors. Now I don't remember on top of my head what was like you know, but it, it also looked like what something is 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 you're giving like more, more you know playground for the device to, to play with this. So that's why I wanted to ask like how much because you're making this, this statement like you know that root is hardened. Yeah. Overall, so, so how did you look at this combination? No, 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 I, I did not. I basically re relied on oh, this okay. and 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 the the, because, the hardening patches that had been okay, done because, by the community. Yeah, we looked in very small subset, and and we haven't even ventured fully to say, okay, you know, and, and this is also the subset. Lost. So nothing else has been even for our fuzzing. So, so. okay, that, 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 thank you. Yeah, I'll look at the packed vert queue layout to see if there's like a fundamental problem why why it's not something that's safe. Because usually these layouts use indices rather than some kind of you know pointer that can be abused or something. But I don't think there should be a reason, but maybe. Yeah. Sorry. No, just to say that, like, you know, I think I think we are, like, you know, we are not virtual maintainers, so this is not, you know, you have much more expertise in this code. So if you can indeed, like, you know, make the statements that you have audited it, maybe we can have the fuzzing and so on, and, and then we can kind of, you know, say that, okay, we, now yeah. we believe that both of these modes are secure. Okay. There's... Uh, yeah, um, there's what I believe to be... Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, we kind of looked at the code uh, for Pact as well, I think. Um, it, we, we, I mean, just the virtual maintainers, uh, I think me and Jason tried to look at it, just, you know, from code inspection, I don't think we see issues, uh, but we didn't do fuzzing. We have time for one last question before we need to move on, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's what I believe to be another open issue that I'd just like to point out for uh, attention by this community. Uh, if you go to slide 22, I think it was. Um, yes, there, the second bullet point, uh, storage device and crypt disk with DM, integri uh, DM crypt plus DM integrity through device cannot inspect or tamper with stored data. I believe that claim needs a qualifier. Um, DM integrity, uh, when I audited it, didn't seem to provide the guarantees that I think a lot of people assume that it does. Uh, DM Verity has a Merkle tree across the whole block device, and so you can't modify any of the things. And DM integrity does not, uh, at least if I recall correctly from when I looked at it, but rather has a per sector uh, authentication tag. If those are not tied into some kind of Merkle tree for the block device as a whole, then that means that you, that it, it seems to me that there is an opportunity for rollback attacks against selected sectors. If that's part of your threat model, then that seems to be unaddressed by the stuff that's available right now. There was something in the academic literature called DMX, which did a full block device Merkle tree thing like uh, DM Verity, but uh, for mutable block devices, but that's not upstream. And so there's this, there appears to be this opportunity for attacker malleability. If anyone's interested in solving that, I'd super like to talk to you. <laughs>
upgrades. It's too late anyway. We need to move on, unfortunately. Otherwise, we're cutting into the other speaker's time. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you.